As one of the hardest hitters the game's ever seen, he could have been the greatest safety of all time, except he never got the chance to prove it, and his story became one of the most tragic in NFL history. So how good was Sean Taylor actually? While his childhood was far from a fairy tale, thanks to an ugly divorce and a neighborhood surrounded by violence, it molded Taylor into the person and athlete he'd one day become. At a very young age, Taylor's parents went through an extremely messy divorce, so he spent his early years living in Homestead, Florida, with his great-grandmother Olga Clark and his mother Donna Jr. When he was seven, his mom was charged with a misdemeanor for attempted interference with custody. Two years later, she lost custody of her son, so Taylor moved to Miami-Dade County to live with his dad, Pete, a police officer. Pete was determined to make up for lost time and knew his son was in desperate need of a father figure. As a kid, Sean was shy and making friends didn't come naturally to him, and it didn't help that the area they lived in was sandwiched between two violent and dangerous neighborhoods. So Sean turned to sports as a safe haven and a way to bond with his dad. Together they ran, lifted weights, and pulled tires on the beach. Pete also had Sean doing 500 push-ups and 1,000 sit-ups every day. Sean fell in love with the grind, so much so that as he got older, he would train by himself and go out for midnight runs. His friends said that he would disappear for hours because he wanted to be alone and work out. They're running at nighttime, morning time, before school, after school, like, just running. Time Taylor was in high school at Gulliver Prep, he had blossomed into one of the top athletes in all of Miami-Dade County, an area well known for sports. At Gulliver, Taylor starred on the football, track, and basketball teams. Thanks to the countless hours working out with his dad and by himself, he possessed a unique combination of strength and speed. On the gridiron, he played both offense and defense, shining as a running back and safety. As a senior, Taylor rushed for 1,400 yards and a state record 44 touchdowns, while adding in over 100 tackles. He played so fast and so hard out there that he once hit an opponent with so much force that the boy's helmet came off as his face mask and screws completely fell apart. After leading his squad to a state title, Taylor put his superhuman speed to further use by winning a state championship in the 100-meter dash and was one of the state's top 400-meter dash sprinters. As an all-around freak of nature who would do whatever he wanted on the football field, Taylor was rated the number one overall prospect in Miami-Dade County. He was also labeled as one of the top skill players in the country. And when it came time to choose a college, he had his pick of the litter and could have gone anywhere he wanted. But ultimately, Taylor decided to stay home and committed to the University of Miami. While he had grown accustomed to being the star on all of his teams, Taylor began his Miami career as nothing more than a small fish in a big pond. The Hurricanes were coming off an 11-1 season and had a unanimous All-American safety in Ed Reed coming back for his senior year. Stockpiled with future NFL talent, it appeared Miami didn't have a need for Taylor's services just yet. But all that changed once they saw how electric he was on the field. Becoming one of just four true freshmen on the team to appear in a game that season, Taylor carved a role for himself in Miami's nickel and dime coverage packages. He finished with 26 tackles as the Hurricanes won the national championship. Heading into the following season, expectations were not only high for the team, but also for Taylor in particular. With Reed gone after being drafted in the first round, the responsibility now fell on Taylor to anchor Miami's stout defense. He stepped up and finished with 85 tackles, 15 pass deflections, 4 interceptions, 1 forced fumble, 1 blocked kick, and 1 punt return for a touchdown. Taylor's strong sophomore season gave him the confidence to take his game to a whole other level. As a junior, he etched his name into Miami football lore by winning the Big East Defensive Player of the Year and was named a unanimous first-team All-American. That season, Taylor led the nation in interceptions with 10 and set a school record with three pick-sixes. In addition to being an elite ball hawk, Taylor also blew up his fair share of opponents with his ferocious hitting. As legendary college football coach Bobby Bowden put it, he hits as hard as he covers. After Taylor's dominant season with one year of eligibility still remaining, he decided that it was time to move on and declared for the 2004 NFL Draft. I'm Sean Taylor, University of Miami, the hardest hitter in the draft. A close family friend said he left school early to take care of his family and his mother. His whole family was a big part of that. Sean was her entire world, and they became very, very close as the years went on. 
He wanted to bring that family together. It's still unclear how or why it happened, but Taylor and his mom had reconnected. On draft day, she and Taylor's great-grandmother were right by his side. Unlike most potential top picks, he chose to skip a trip to New York City and instead had a draft party at a friend's house, where he invited his younger brother's Pop Warner team after spending $17,000 on gold and diamond national title rings for them. Ahead of the draft, Taylor had established himself as a can't-miss prospect. Along with his extremely impressive college career, at Miami's Pro Day, he ran a 4.5140 yard dash. A 6'2", 230-pound safety simply isn't supposed to be able to do that. And it's why Taylor became the first defender off the board when the Washington Redskins took him with the fifth overall pick, which was super early for a safety. Washington Redskins select Sean Taylor. The Texans GM at the time, Charlie Casserly, said, Traditionally, you can get safeties that can play pretty good for you, even go to the Pro Bowl in the later rounds. So if there's a choice, you can move the safety off a little bit farther. But Washington just couldn't wait after seeing something special in Taylor. The Redskins had a huge amount of belief in him. Unfortunately, the organization soon found itself disappointed and frustrated with their top pick. Taylor was fine. $25,000 for skipping a mandatory rookie symposium. So, well, it's three days. They teach you how to be an NFL football player. And he said, I'm not doing this. What are you talking about? He said, I'm going back to Miami. It was an unideal start to his pro career and a sign of future off-field problems to come. Luckily for Taylor and the Redskins, he had zero issues adjusting on the field. In the first preseason game against the Broncos, Taylor loudly announced his arrival with two interceptions, including a pick six. But despite a strong showing in the preseason, he was still named the team's backup safety. This news only motivated Taylor to go harder in practice, and by week three, he was named a starter. Taylor took that starting spot and never lost looked back. He let everyone know that his ability to take a receiver's head off or chase him down in the open field translated at the next level. His show-stopping play earned him the nickname Meast, which was a combination of half-man, half-beast. Taylor finished his rookie year with 76 tackles, a team-high four interceptions, nine pass deflections, and two forced fumbles, as he was named to the Pro Football Writers Association All-Rookie Team. But while Taylor showed flashes of being a superstar in the making, his actions away from the field threatened to derail everything. In the middle of of his rookie season, he was arrested and charged with drunk driving after a night of partying. How much have you had to drink? Drink. Just one drink? While that charge was later dismissed, Taylor, during the ensuing offseason, was charged with a felony for aggravated assault with a firearm. His erratic behavior was troubling, to say the least, and Taylor's unwillingness to change almost cost the Redskins their season in 2005. And I was kind of looking at it as a coach, going, man, we got a great player, but this guy. He's going to be hard to handle. <laughs> With 70 tackles, two interceptions, 10 pass deflections, and two forced fumbles, Taylor helped Washington make its first playoff appearance since 1999. And then, their wildcard matchup with the Buccaneers perfectly encapsulated the roller coaster that was dealing with Taylor. During the first quarter, he gave the Redskins a 14 0 lead by returning a fumble 51 yards for a touchdown. Sean Taylor! We haven't heard a whistle yet, and Sean Taylor is gone. But then in the third quarter, he was ejected for spitting in the face of Bucks running back Michael Pittman. The word we got is he spit in Pittman's face. Even though Taylor denied spitting, this wasn't the first time he had been accused of doing so. We in the ref face. No, oh, he didn't do it. And we go back and watch film, and you just see big as day. The spit glob come out. During his rookie season, he allegedly spit in the face of Bengals wide receiver TJ Hushmanzada, but there was no clear video evidence of it. Nonetheless, with Taylor ejected from the game, Washington was forced to find a way to win without their anchor on defense. And heading into the 2006 season, all eyes were on him, and not for the right reason. Although Taylor's on-field play had been strong, all of the outside noise about his character finally forced him to look inwards, and he attacked that season determined to silence his haters. Taylor showed up to practices before anybody else as coaches regularly saw him working out on the field an hour early. And he wasn't just doing this for show, either. Washington's defensive coordinator Greg Williams said he thinks he's doing it when no one else is watching. He didn't want credit. His credit is exerting his will on people on the field. Having cleaned up his act and gotten his priorities straight, Taylor was a man on a mission who couldn't be stopped. He took out all his frustration on his opponents. Taylor led the team in tackles with 114 and forced fumbles with three. Throughout the year, Williams often called Taylor the best
best athlete he had ever coached. All this grinding behind the scenes paid off as he was named to his first career Pro Bowl, which provided fans and players with an unforgettable moment that, over a decade later, still finds itself going viral on social media. In an all-star game known for its lack of effort, Taylor broke the norm. As Bills punter Brian Mormon tried to run for a first down on a fake punt, Taylor completely laid him out. It was a move that shocked commentators and electrified everyone in attendance. While you could argue that there's no place for that type of vicious hit in an exhibition game, it was nothing more than Taylor being himself. He only knew how to play the game one way, at full speed with reckless abandon. It was a playing style that earned Taylor the respect of everyone watching and put the fear in everyone else going up against him. Ahead of the 2007 season, Sports Illustrated named Taylor Taylor the hardest-hitting player in the league, and not a single person argued with this title. He had clearly earned this reputation, but Taylor wanted to prove he was just as skilled as a ball hawk, too. So in a Week 6 game against the Packers, he did exactly that. Taylor picked off future Hall of Famer Brett Favre twice. He was so locked in that he could have had five interceptions that day if he hadn't dropped three others. It was an unforgettable performance that left Taylor's teammates in awe. Redskins running back Clinton Portis said it was his NFL coming out party. Although he had done so much prior, that was his claim to fame, saying, I have arrived. Just to see that range, to be able to bait a Hall of Fame quarterback like Brett Favre the way you did and cover that field, it's not like Favre has a weak arm. He can get the ball anywhere on the field. It showed his ceiling. Fellow Redskins safety Pearson Prelo added, I remember going over the film and looking at each other at what we just witnessed. We were amazed at what we had just witnessed. I'm still amazed to this day. No matter what play you turn the film on, Sean was in on that play. He was everywhere. It was the game that solidified who he was and who he could be as an NFL safety. But just a month and a half later, tragedy struck. While in his Miami home, Taylor was shot in the leg during a burglary gone wrong. At just 24 years old, Sean Taylor suffered massive blood loss and died in the hospital. He said that he never seen a man fight for his life as hard as he did. At the time of his death, he was second in the league with five interceptions. Taylor was posthumously named to that year's Pro Bowl, an honor that's never been done before. During the game, each Redskin player wore number 21, and on the first play, the NFC lined up with just one safety. It was a nod to a legend in the making who was taken way too soon. His one-of-a-kind, fearless playing style will never be replicated, but it will also never be forgotten. As a potential future Hall of Famer on the field, it's just as important to remember his impact away from the game. Taylor had come a long way in his maturation and always put his family first. He gave his mom $222,000 to purchase a three-bedroom townhouse. He handed out checks or bags filled with cash to his siblings, half-siblings, and cousins. He purchased a $900,000 home just for his family. The family house, everybody can come there and feel comfortable. Whenever I was around all of them, it just made me feel whole and even shared his bank account with his dad. Taylor was a family man who just so happened to also be an amazing football player. The impact he made on the NFL in just four seasons is a testament to just how special he was. His legacy will forever live on.